Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Today we will continue the sermon series on the book of Acts and look at the conversion of Saul, who was also known as the Apostle Paul in the Bible. He was once a horrible persecutor, but soon he had become a faithful preacher of the name of Jesus, all because he encountered him on the road to Damascus. In the 18th century, a scholar named George Littleton and his friend Benjamin Gilbert West were initially convinced that the Bible was just a hoax. They figured that they would only need to disprove two events in the Bible to destroy the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus and the conversion of Paul. And as they began their research, they were overwhelmed by the amount of evidence and landed on the conclusion that Christianity had to be true. And to everyone's surprise, they became Christians and published their research for the purpose of evangelism. Friends, have you ever tried to pursue something that you were so convinced that you were on the right path only to find out in the end that you were completely wrong in the first place? Conversion, in the simplest sense, is the change of direction from living our life our way to living our life God's way. I would like to begin with these questions. Are you living your life your way or God's way? Are you on your way to Jesus or something else? Do you know who Jesus is? And have you ever encountered him in a personal way? My prayer is that by the end of the sermon, you will be touched by the Holy Spirit and find all these answers to the questions. Now, before we read the passage, I would like to give you a background of Paul. Paul was born in the family of Pharisees and he started to follow the law of Moses as early as he could speak. At the age of four, he would begin to memorize Genesis through Deuteronomy. And at the age of 13, he was sent to follow a top-notch rabbi called Gamaliel to master the entire Old Testament. Paul was a Jew by birth, but he was also a Roman citizen, which had given him much privilege in the first century. Paul was no doubt a scholar in his times, and he began his bright career as a brilliant young man, a professional lawyer in Judaism. And all signs pointed to his becoming a member of the Sanhedrin, a governing body that would rule over the life and the religion of his people. In the eyes of the world, his resume was remarkable. He was passionate, he was educated, he was absolutely convinced of the way of life and his own righteousness. But his encounter with Jesus changed everything. That later on he said, I consider everything that I've gained garbage for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. So, what exactly had happened on the road to Damascus? Let's dive into the text. Chapter 9 from the book of Acts, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the law, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The picture painted here by Luke is fascinating. Saul is on his way to persecute anyone belonging to the way. Christianity was referred to as the way in the first century. And this phrase, the way, is used five times in the book of Acts. The Greek word, odos, literally means the way on the road or the street. Christians were called the followers of the way because Christianity is more than just a set of doctrines that we believe. It is also a way of living that Jesus invited his disciples to follow. Saul was breathing threats and murder going on his way to bound the followers of Jesus, and he was suddenly halted by this gigantic voice from above. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, when he recounted his conversion experience in chapter 26, he says this, At midday, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me 
and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goals. The double address of his name is not something usual. If you read through the entire Bible, you will find only less than 20 occasions anybody is addressed by the repetition of their names. When Martha was busy and worried about many things in the house, Jesus said with care and concern, He says, Martha, Martha. When Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem, His heart was stirred with compassion. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. When Jesus knew that Peter was about to betray him, he said, Simon, Simon, I pray for you, and when you return, strengthen your brothers. Now, this double address of names is a Hebrew expression of intimacy, used only by the people who are closest and dearest to us. Saul had committed great sins, yet this voice from heaven is saying to him, I know you, I know you intimately, I know everything about you, but why are you hurting me? Now imagine how shocked and confused Saul must have felt. Now first, who is this person who knows my name? Second, why does he call me like someone who knows everything about me? And third, when did I persecute him? So. What exactly were the problems of Saul before his conversion? And what are the implications for us? I believe number one is his self-righteousness. Saul felt that he was doing the right thing all his life. He thought he knew the truth from the scriptures better than any others. He was fully convinced that he was doing the right thing, what his religion required, and serving God by persecuting Christians. He thought to himself, yes, I make mistakes, but after all, I'm a good person. Friends, the number one enemy to the gospel is self-righteousness. A self-righteous person rejects the righteousness of God in Jesus and seeks to save themselves through other means. Now here's what the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 3 says, Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, They did not submit to God's righteousness. Not only do self-righteous people reject the salvation of Jesus, they see themselves as the moral standard. They are their own God who decides what is good and what is evil in their own eyes. Now, if you look at the world, you will see that we are living in a society dominated by the worldview of self. Morality is often constructed based on a matter of perspective how a person identify himself according to his own desire and interpretation, how he sees, perceives, and feels about the world and himself. Self-righteousness is a sin, a terrible disease, a terrible sickness that blinds us from seeing the truth. Self-righteousness is not only a problem the world is facing, it is also a problem that plagues the body of Christ. For Christians often see ourselves as morally superior to the others. We take credit for our good behaviors and transformations. We rely on our own strength and glorify our righteousness instead of what belongs to Jesus. We look at others, sometimes gloating with a haughty spirit, thinking in our heart, thank God I'm not like them and I'm better. Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God, not our ability, that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, not by our deeds, from first to last, not just the beginning, but also the entire journey of our Christian faith. Just as it is written, he says, the righteous will live by faith. The number one problem before our conversion is self-righteousness. Now, number two, 
The problem of Saul before his conversion, he has been persecuting the people of God without him even realizing. It is very interesting that Jesus didn't say to Saul, why are you persecuting the people? He said, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is saying, you touch my people, you are touching me. You hurt my people, you are hurting me. Because Jesus is a God who stands and identify with his people. When his people are sorrowful, Jesus is sorrowful. When his people are delighted, Jesus is delighted. When his people suffer, Jesus bears the pain of their suffering. Here's what Jesus says regarding the judgment day we all need to face one day. In Matthew chapter 25, he says, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. As you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Now, as Christians, our faith is not only a vertical relationship with God. We are also signing up in a horizontal relationship to care for those who belong to the body of Christ. Who are the people of God placed around you? He said, your spouse, your brother and sisters in church, your Christian boss, your Christian colleagues, your subordinates, your business partners. Have you ever hurt them? dishonor them, curse them, taken advantage of them, or exploited them for what they rightly deserve? Have you done your best to protect them, honor them, love them, and care for their needs? These questions are worth pondering every day because whatever we do unto them, we are doing that unto the Lord. Number three, souls is always opposing the purpose of God before his conversion. Jesus said to Saul in chapter 26, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goals. A goal is a pointy stick farmers use to prop the oxen and steer them in the right direction when plowing the ground. Now, if an ox rebels and kick against the goals, it is going to hurt itself severely. Jesus is using this imagery to remind Saul, why are you kicking against my will and purpose in your life? I have created you. I know everything about you. I know what is the best plan for you. But if you choose to live your life your way, you are just inflicting pain on yourself. Many people find the commandments of God tough and demanding. But the commandments of God are never meant to be given with the intention to destroy us. They are meant to preserve us from dangers in life and teach us the way of life that we may live it abundantly. The Creator knows how it works, and we don't. When God corrects us, it is a bit painful, but sometimes it is necessary for God to prop and goad us in a way that we should go, and whenever we are lost, and so that we may get back on track and live in the way in accordance with the design of God. Yes, the love of God is not always romantic. Sometimes it is a tough love, just like parents to children. Here's what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. Now friends, what is the purpose and will of God in your life? Do you know what you are created for? Is your lifestyle pleasing to God? And are you on the right track to reach the full potential God has prepared for you in your life? Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21 says, Many are the plans in the minds of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. For those who don't believe, they will experience agony only to find themselves fighting against God. But for those who surrender, you can be comforted to know that the Lord will complete the good work He had begun in your life. Now let's go to Acts 22 and see how Saul responded to this divine intervention in his life. Chapter 22, verse 8. Paul says, And I answer, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me 
saw the saw the lights but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me and i said what shall i do lord and the lord said to me rise and go into damascus and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do and since i could not see because of the brightness of the light i was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into damascus uh, friends if you could see god face to face what would you like to ask him? The passage we just read today has included two most important questions Saul had ever asked in his entire life. And I believe these are the two important questions that we should ask every day of our life. The first one is, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Christ the Center, explained perfectly how we should know Jesus a creator God who comes from beyond the creation. He says, when we study an unknown object, we always want to answer two questions in general. What is the cost of this object? And what is the meaning of this object? As Bonhoeffer suggested, both are a matter of classification. How do we fit this object into the existing categories, the existing order within the creation? but he challenges all the people who are seeking to know Jesus. What if this object really is the creator who comes from outside the creation that is beyond our time and space, beyond what our logic can fathom, beyond what our language can describe? And if that's the case, the only question we should ask is, who are you, Lord? Saul was overwhelmed by this divine intervention this encounter was beyond anything he was taught and anything he experienced in the past that he could only ask with humility. Who are you, Lord? This is a very personal question every one of us must ask, and we must ask with humility. Who are you, Lord? Now, how many times when people come to know God, they attempt to analyze the person of Jesus as if he was just like any other created beings? They reduce the deity and transcendency of Jesus to the level that it could make sense to the minds and logics of humans. But what if he really is the God of all creation? And if that's the case, we should be asking, Who are you, Lord? We must let God to reveal himself as he says he is, not what we feel he is, not what we think he is, not even what the world says he is. But friends, do you know who Jesus is? There may be voices or informations that you may know about him, but the best way to know Jesus in a personal way is to open the Bible, develop your prayer life, and begin an authentic relationship with him by asking the questions, Who are you, Lord? C.S. Lewis says, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, but if it is true, it's of infinite importance, and the only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Jesus Christ is either of no importance to you or the most important person in your life. He is worth your time to seek him. Now the second question Saul have asked as he encountered Jesus, and I believe that we should be asking every day, is what shall I do, Lord? Saul thought that he knew Jesus. He thought that he was a criminal, crucified and die on the cross. He thought that the resurrection of Jesus preached by the Christians was nothing more than a fabricated story. But as he encountered Jesus on the way to Damascus, the offer of life, the promised Messiah, there was nothing else he wanted to pursue except to please the God who created him. He asked the question, what shall I do, Lord? He had encountered the truth and was touched by the grace of Jesus that he couldn't help but to surrender his life to Jesus, that his remaining time on earth, his knowledge, his talents, and whatever he gained in the past may be used for the glory of his God. That's why he said in Galatians chapter 2, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now friends, instead of asking God to do what you want, have you ever asked God what he wants you to do? If you long to seek the purpose of God in your life and receive the greatest satisfaction by doing His will, may I invite you to ask the question, 
What shall I do, Lord? When Paul encountered Jesus, his life was completely changed, and he no longer lived his life in a way that pleases himself, but God alone. No more my way, only the way. Here's what Jesus says, says to us in Matthew chapter 7. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. There are many ways in this world that are easy and comfortable. That's what the majority chooses, but it leads to destruction. The way of Jesus, however, is narrow and hard. It is going against the motion and patterns of this world. But the Bible says, this is the way that leads to life. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, are you on your way to Jesus or something else? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the grace of God in our life. We thank you for your mercy, your love that you have shown in our life through the person of Jesus Christ. And Father, I just pray that you're going to just draw the people who are listening to the Word of God, who are listening to the sermon, to you. You says in the Bible, those who are pure in heart, they will see you. And Father, help us to ask the questions what shall I do, Lord? And every day we will do your will and seek to fulfill the purpose of God in our life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.